Nice. Well, welcome back, you guys. Um, for everyone else, uh, summas are, it's named after the Summa Theologica, which is St. Thomas Aquinas' great work, right? It's, a, it's his big compendium of like his knowledge, or at least one of them, um, and, and his, he poured out the knowledge of the faith. And so um, we named these knights Summa Knights because for our parish of St. Thomas Aquinas, it's our great work of just trying to like pour back into our community, especially all of our adults and parents. Um, be able to share a little faith with you and bring it to your level, to where you're at, to kind of help you bring back into your families and into your work environments and to your friendships. Um, and hopefully it's something that just continuously uplifts you. We're gonna be doing this every month, all the way through May. Um, and, and every year we take a topic, we take, we're like a, a concept, and we're like, we're gonna explore this, go into a little more detail. Last year we did a 50,000 foot view of scripture, and we walked through all the different pieces all like, like, so that if you're reading something in the gospel today, you know what came before. And so, so we went through scripture last year, and those are still all, all online, and they are um, uh, great to watch back if you want to see all the speakers we had then. Um, and this year, we're kind of we're kind of following the trend. That's I don't know if it, how many people here are, are doing the Catechism in a Year podcast with uh, Father Mike Schmitz. Okay, so some of you guys, yeah, it's pretty awesome. And uh, there's been a new resurgence in the Catechism, and I thought like, why not? So where where that um, is once again a a very detailed look into the Catechism, where Father Mike Schmitz is every day like diving into a chunk of the Catechism and really like like go into like the detail and the minutia of it, um, which is beautiful. Not everybody is a podcast person, I'm not. Um, at, like I tried, and I got like day four, like on the last year's Bible one, and I got 45 days in, and then the next thing I know, I'm like 75 days behind. I'm like, what happened? So um, I'm just not that person. I Mostly because I don't have a commute, I like drive four minutes to get here, so that's exciting. Um, but, so I'm not really a podcast person. So instead, like these summas are kind of a supplement to that, like a, a different look at that. We're gonna be like looking at the catechism as a whole. Um, we're gonna be exploring like what it is and, and what, we're, what we're doing with it. So um, <clears throat> real quick, so if you, uh, any of you guys are parents that dropped off your kids over at catechism, this is, it's at this time for you because this is a great time for you to be able to drop off your kids, come in and while they're getting fed some, with a little bit of more spiritual knowledge and their faith is growing, you have an opportunity to come over here and get your faith life fed a little bit too. So it's it's during this time specifically for you. For everyone else, this is this is something for everybody. It's every adult that you that wants to come. Like if if you're whether you're like you have a best friend that wants to be here or your greatest enemy, invite them. They are welcome to be here. Um, it's great to have uh, everybody just like learn a little bit more about the faith that God gave us. And in what better way than through one of the books that's just really been like instrumental in helping uh, people understand the faith. So um, I'm gonna give you a little a little mini intro into the catechism, and then I'm gonna introduce our speaker for tonight, um, and and then we'll get started. So um, I, I didn't even introduce myself, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm Andrew Starbuck, I'm the Director of Faith Formation here at the parish, uh, and it's my honor to bring you this today. So let's go ahead and we'll open it with a real quick prayer and then we'll get started. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of every person here, um, for their yes to showing up. We ask you that every person here, no matter whether they are not even Catholic, brand new to the faith, um, been experiencing the faith for a long time, or they're just having a, re a resurgence of, of the faith, that they may be open to hearing whatever you're speaking to their life tonight through our speaker. And we just ask you, Lord, to bless each and every one of us and our families, especially all those children on the other side of the campus, that they may um, just be enjoying this, this step in their own faith journey as well. And we ask for our Mother Mary, as always, to intercede for us and to pray for us and to wrap us in her mantle of protection as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, grace, the Lord is with thee. Bless our thou among women, and bless is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So, the Catechism of the Catholic Church is a compilation of the teachings of Holy Mother Church. Um, organized into four parts. These four pillars uh, of the Catechism cover basically the entirety of human, the human experience. It's what we believe, it's how we worship, how we love, or I'm sorry, how we live, and then how we pray. 
The Catechism draws from many different sources, including sacred scripture, ecumenical councils, pontifical documents, the writings of saints like St. Ignatius, St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, and many more. As Catholic Christians, we can turn to the Catechism as a trustworthy and systematic approach to the fundamental teaching of the Catholic faith. The Catechism, despite what many people may believe, isn't just for priests and clergy and bishops and stuff, but like it's, but St. John Paul II actually said that the Catechism is offered to all the faithful who want to understand better the inexhaustible riches of salvation. During this year's Assumenites, we will look at some big questions and utilize all four pillars of the Catechism to seek out solid, dependable answers, teaching you how to go deeper into your knowledge of God and his church using the compiled truths found in this amazing book. So if you have your catechisms, you can open them up. If you don't, uh, if, you are, if you're an app person, Ladate is a great option. It's a free app that has the catechism in it. Um, and throughout this entire year, we're going to have our speakers actually walk you through looking at a big question and then how do we find the answer to that question as we go look at all the different, the four different pillars of the catechism. Uh, tonight's speaker is... Um, it is an awesome guy who happens to work right across the street. He works over at JP2 as a, as a teacher there. He also has um, an awesome blog, podcast, um, media presence. It's called Good Distinctions. Um, and it's just a great, it's a great opportunity to like, look at some of those big, those, those bigger questions of faith, but in a very uh, kind of like tight way in making those distinctions. Um, but I was really excited to have uh, Will just join us for this first night and really kind of break open the catechism and our first topic. So please give it up for Mr. Will Wright. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So I want to start with, uh, well, we'll start with this. This is from Acts chapter 2, verse 42. So of course, Acts of the Apostles being the sequel of the Gospel of Luke, the beginning of the early church. Okay. They, I already stopped the passage, they who? They, the apostles, the early Christians. All right, everybody tracking so far? Just nod your heads. Good. All right, I don't want to lose anyone. All right. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, to the communal life, to the breaking of the bread, and to the prayers. They devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles, the communal life, breaking of the bread, and the prayers. And what we have here are the four pillars of the catechism. I mean, this is exactly what the early church had. It's what we've had for the last 2,000 years. And it's what we've always followed as Christians, that we live in these four different modes. The teachings of the apostles, what do we believe? What's the profession of faith? What do we actually believe as Christians and as Catholics? The communal life. How do we interact with people around us? How many of you have people in your lives that you wish weren't always around you all the time? Come on, everybody raise your hand. Come on, come on. It's okay. It's a safe, it's a safe place. We don't have to name names. But how do we interact with other human beings who at times can be difficult? Also... Keep your hands up if you can also be difficult from time to time. There you go. Okay, good. Uh, very good. When you wanted to talk bad about other people, you didn't raise your hand. And when you wanted to talk bad about yourself, you all raised your hand. You must be Catholic. <laughs> good. Knock it off. No, let's, let's find a balance here. So, what's next? Teaching the apostles, communal life, the breaking of the bread. So that just stands in for the Eucharist, as well as all of the sacraments, the whole sacramental life. And then prayer. That fuel that goes in the engine, that, that relationship with God, that what uh, the saints call that surge of the heart up towards God, that's indispensable. So we have these four different pillars in the catechism. But the way the catechism is organized, I have mine here. One of my friends actually had it leather bound for me, which is really awesome. Uh, so I, I love this. I also put little tabs on it. You can get these uh, around. I don't know if they have them in the store, I'm sure they do, but, um, you know, the Catechism really sets the tone right in paragraph one. So if you have your Catechism and you'd like to follow along, I'm looking at paragraph one. And what it does is it shows us 
what's called the kerygma, which just means kernel in Greek. It's that the kernel of the faith. What do we believe as Catholics? What's the core gospel message? And so here it is, beautifully expounded. God, infinitely perfect and blessed in himself, in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man to make him share in his own blessed life. For this reason, at every time and in every place, God draws close to man. He calls man to seek him, to know him, to love him with all his strength. He calls together all men scattered and divided by sin into the unity of his family, the church. To accomplish this, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son as redeemer and savior. In his son and through him, he invites men to become in the Holy Spirit, his adopted children, and thus heirs of his blessed life. It's a beautiful uh, summary of our faith. It's a beautiful encapsulation of what the gospel is. So if anyone ever asks you, what do you believe as Catholics? What you could easily do is just go right into saying the creed. And I believe in God, the Father Almighty, etc. Or you could read that first paragraph and say, look, we know the gospel. Here it is. And then it goes on. Okay, so we have the gospel. What's next? Paragraph number two has the Great Commission. It's talking about how Jesus, before he ascends into heaven, says to the apostles, All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you to the close of the age. And then he ascends into heaven. And then it gets into these three pillar, or these four pillars. So this is from paragraph three. Those who with God's help have welcomed Christ's call and freely responded to it are urged on by love of Christ to proclaim the good news everywhere in the world. This treasure, so they call it a treasure, received from the apostles has been faithfully guarded by their successors. All Christ's faithful are called to hand it on from generation to generation by professing the faith, by living it in fraternal sharing, by celebrating it in liturgy and prayer. So going back to Acts 2.42, that's exactly what that is, right? It's drawing directly from Scripture there. They devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles, breaking of the bread, communal life, and prayer. And so in those first three paragraphs of the Catechism, we see exactly what the Catechism does. It introduces us to the good news of Jesus Christ, that showing us that we have a duty to share it with others, and then tells us exactly how. Just think about this. If you were one of the apostles, put yourself back 2,000 years ago, and Jesus said those words to you, teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's a lot. <laughs> have you ever thought about that? Or have you ever thought about what St. John says in the end of his gospel? St. John, in the, the very last chapter of his gospel, says this. Sorry, I didn't have it marked. So John 21, this is the conclusion. It is this disciple who testifies to these things and has written them. And we know that his testimony is true. There are also many other things that Jesus did... But if these were to be described individually, I do not think the whole world would contain the books that would be written. That's, that's a lot. So, how do we summarize all of this? How do we as Catholics, how do we as followers of Christ know everything that we need to know in order to be able to share it? If you're feeling any anxiety right now, take a deep breath and realize you don't have to. Good. Okay. Whose job is it to convert people? The Holy Spirit, right? Not you, not me. So that's good, right? That should give us, okay, I can breathe a sigh of relief. It's not my job to convert people. So what is our, our, what is our job? Well, it's our job to share the good news. And we do that with the testimony of our lives. We do that with the testimony of our words. So it's, it's, not an all, it's not a one thing or another. We have to live as Christians. We have to speak as Christians. Our words and deeds, all of it. 
So the Catechism presents this organic synthesis of the faith, the essential and fundamental doctrines of the church, faith and moral teachings of the church that don't change those principles of faith and morals, uh, in light of the Second Vatican Council, which happened in the 1960s, as well as the whole church's tradition. If you read the Catechism and you're looking through, uh, what I call it is reading it upside down. You read the footnotes and you realize that it's, it's saturated with sacred scripture. It's saturated with the council, the councils of the church, the church fathers of the early church. They're drawing from all sorts of different sources. And it's really incredible because the catechism, this catechism in particular, is one of the first truly universal catechisms of the Catholic Church. And that's a, a testament to the, the fact that we are so interconnected today. Right? This wasn't possible 500 years ago. You know, there was a time six or 700 years ago where one of the saints had to write to his friend in Rome to ask him what the name of the Pope was so that he could say it in the Mass. Because he had no idea who the Pope was. How many of you know who the Pope is currently? Anyone? Pope Francis. Where did Pope Benedict go? No, I'm just kidding. I knew. But it would be absurd for me to stand up here and say I don't know who the Pope is, right? We are so interconnected. The internet is a, a crazy technology. Uh, but even before the internet, the fact that we had instantaneous communication just talking on the phone or telegraphs, these sorts of things, we can't really wrap our heads around what it was like before that. And nonetheless, even though the technology has changed, the call to evangelize has not changed. So after that, in paragraphs 13 to 17, it goes over the structure of the catechism, and then in 18 to 22, we see practical directions for how to use it. So there's a lot of good stuff in here. And there's a couple features that I just want to point out. I know that I can't really show you this very well, um, but in bold, there's paragraph numbers. So if something says CCC and then a number, that's Catechism of the Catholic Church and then the paragraph number. Right? Nod your heads if you've heard about this before. Actually, how about this? Raise your hand if you've never opened the Catechism in your life. And it's totally okay if you haven't. I just need to know. Perfect. We're going to go into it. All right. So it's organized into those four sections. Right? Profession of Faith is part one. And in that, there's different chapters and sections and articles and all of this. Section two is the, the uh, profession of the Christian faith. Um, I'm sorry, that's part, that's section two. See, this is where it gets complicated. Part one is the profession of faith. Part two is the celebration of the Christian mystery. So that's all about the sacraments. So I'm going a little too quickly. I'm very excited about the catechism. I love it. <laughs> part one, call that the creed. Okay, everybody tracking so far? Good. So what do we believe? That's part one. Part two is the celebration of the Christian mystery. It goes over the seven sacraments of the church. Baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, holy orders, matrimony, anointing of the sick, and penance. Then in part three, we have life in Christ. Basically, I could call that the Beatitudes and the Ten Commandments. It just goes through those as a sort of broad thematic theme. And then finally, Christian prayer. Uh, anyone want to take a guess as to what they go through in that? The Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, the perfect prayer, right? Uh, that's the second part. The first part is just what is prayer in the life of the church. So it's organized very practically. And like I said, when we look at the footnotes, we see scripture all throughout. Because as the Second Vatican Council said, scripture is the driving force of doctrine. And so everything we believe as Catholics is implicitly or explicitly in Scripture. We are a people who follow the Word of God, who is Jesus Christ, and we believe that the Word of God that is written in Scripture is inerrant, it is good for instruction, all of these things that St. Paul is. So, Scripture is in there. The last 2,000 years of sacred tradition, there's so much that's been written on the subjects of faith, and of course those are in there as well, and it's very poetic at times, it's very beautiful in the way that it's explained. And it's very well set up into those four pillars. But here's what you can do with those four pillars. In part one, which was what? Anybody remember? 
The profession of faith. I want to use the official titles, right? The profession of faith. If I want to know what does the church teach on a given subject, I'll go look in the profession of faith, find that paragraph or section, read it, digest it, all of that. But next to the paragraphs, there's these small numbers in the margin. The entire catechism is hyperlinked. You know anything about websites? You know, you click a hyperlink, it takes you to another place. Well, this is rudimentary hyperlinks. There's cross listings all over the place. So you might be in paragraph 258, but then it might tell you to go to 1783 because they're connected in some way. See? So you can look and actually see how each paragraph, for the most part, a lot of them anyway, have at least one or two cross listings. And so you can look up one thing using the glossary in the back, one subject, and there's a whole bunch of topics in here. You say, well, what does the church teach about that? You go find it, you look it up, and then you can start looking at these cross listings and get a fuller picture. Because instead of just focusing on what does the church teach, profession of faith, we can look at how does that come into to being in the sacramental life, how do we live that out with other people in the communal life? And then how do we interact with God with that in prayer? So you can see how there's a fuller sense to each of these things. None of it's in isolation. Hypothetically, let's say you were talking to someone who's never heard anything about the Christian faith at all. What doctrine would you begin with? I heard Creed and I heard Ten Commandments. Isn't that funny? So think about this. Do we talk about what we believe? Or do we talk about how we should live? I mean, that's really what that boils down to. But here's the thing. There's no right answer and there's no wrong answer when it comes to looking at the catechism and saying, well, I should start here or I should start here. Instead, we have to take a step back and say, I should start with Jesus. The person of Jesus Christ. I love this. This is from Pope Benedict in Deus Caritas S, paragraph 1, his encyclical on love. He says this, and I don't have this written down, but hopefully I won't mess it up. Being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but an encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. That's what it means to be Christian. It means encountering Jesus Christ and following him. And that can take so many different forms. That can, I mean, think about the last 2,000 years and everyone who's come to the faith. Think about yourself. How did you come to the faith? Who told you? Because here's the thing. Faith comes from what is heard. And whether you read yourself into the faith, right, you read enough books, guess what? Those books were written by people. If your parents brought you into the faith, you heard the faith from them. If it was a friend, you heard it from them. None of us came to the faith by ourselves. We all were brought to faith by someone else. Ultimately through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's a beautiful thing because it means that we're not saved by ourselves. Which brings us to a pivotal question. The one that Andrew actually told me to come and talk about. <laughs> Am I worthy of love? It's a really important question. Don't raise your hands, but I want you to ask yourself that question. Am I worthy of love? Some of you might immediately say, well, yes, of course I am. Some of you might be thinking, no, I suck. <laughs> Wherever you are, that's okay. By the end of tonight, you will all be resoundingly answering, yes, I am worthy of love. That's my goal. So let's go. Okay. So in Catechism 218, we hear about God's gratuitous love. And I love that word gratuitous. What does gratuitous mean? Free. Free. It just means free. In the course of its history, Israel was able to discover that God had only one reason to reveal himself to them. A single motive for choosing them among all the peoples in his possession, for his special possession. His sheer, gratuitous love. 
And thanks to the prophets, Israel understood that it was again out of love that God never stopped saving them and pardoning their unfaithfulness and sins. Okay, so what do we know so far? God's love is free. Next paragraph. God's love for Israel is compared to a father's love for a son. I'll stop there for a second. Maybe your relationship with your father is terrible. And this could be difficult for people. Right? We're human beings. We have emotions. We have feelings. We have pasts and histories. Maybe your father wasn't present. Maybe he was a dirtbag. I don't know what your situation is. But this is where we have to remember that the church often speaks in analogies. So even if your relationship with your father wasn't good, know that you have a father in heaven who is perfect. Now, how you come to realize that, how you come to live that, that's going to take work, it's going to take prayer, and it's going to take effort. But it's beautiful. Once you get there, my goodness, it makes everything better. The, the, the love of God is, is purifying, it's healing. His love for his people is stronger than a mother's for her children. How many of you are mothers? Do you love your children yes. more than life itself? Yes. Would you die for your children in a heartbeat? Yes. God loves you more than you love your children. <laughs> Think about that. God's love, God loves his people more than a bridegroom, his beloved. Gentlemen, how many are married to the love of your life? Okay, that's nothing compared to how much God loves you. His love will be victorious over even the worst infidelities and will extend to his most precious gift. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that we might not die but have eternal life. I asked my students this in, uh, in sacraments class the other day. I said, what is, the, uh, what is the price of sin? So I'll ask the same for you. What, what's the consequence of sin? What do you deserve because of sin? Scripture says death. Uh, we could take that a bit further, and I don't mean this analogously. I mean it quite literally. What do we deserve because of sin? Hell. You know, Father Josh Johnson, I love him. He, he said this in a talk one time, and I was like, well, that's a little abrasive. But it's true, right? How do we, how do we come back from a, offending an infinite, all-loving, all-merciful God? Well, we can't. But he never stops forgiving us. He never stops extending, extending his mercy. As Pope Francis says, he never tires of forgiving us. Because God's love is gratuitous. God's love is stronger than even our sin. And so he doesn't leave us as orphans. God's love is everlasting. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. Through Jeremiah, God declares to his people, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. And so with all of that being said, in paragraph 221, we hear the words from the first letter of John. St. John goes even further when he affirms that God is love. And that's not an analogy, that's, that's a reality. God's very being is is love. By sending his only son in the spirit of love in the fullness of time, God has revealed his innermost secret. God himself is an eternal exchange of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he has destined us to share in that exchange. If we grasp that at all, it's one of the most humbling things imaginable, it's one of the most beautiful things that we can possibly contemplate. That God, infinitely perfect and blessed in himself in a plan of sheer goodness, invites us to take part in his own divine reality of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So if we, if we ask the question, am I worthy of love? We would, ask, we, would, we would look at this idea of sharing in the eternal exchange of the Trinity, and we'd say, am I really worthy of that sort of love? But God shows us a proof for his love. He's not to be outdone in anything, including showing us his love. And we have it right there on the cross. The crucifix shows us 
that God was willing to go to those lengths out of love for you and me. And this isn't some, you know, touchy-feely, nice thing to think about. It's a real, substantial thing. That when we look at the cross, we realize that our sins, your sins and mine, put him there. And he went to the cross anyway, out of love for you and for me. Was Jesus a sinner? That wasn't rhetorical. Let's please answer that one. Was Jesus a sinner? No. Okay, good. There's no heretics in the room, I think. Okay, good, good, good. No, he's perfect. He's God himself. He's the incarnate word of God. He has no sin. He's completely perfect. And yet, he died a horrible death, the death of a, 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 one of the worst criminals, to show us the depths of his love. One of my theology professors at Franciscan University said, it's not necessary that Jesus went to the cross. It was fitting, but not necessary. If Jesus wanted to save us from our sins, he could have done so simply by becoming one of us. Think about the things that go along with being human. Imagine that the, the Son of God walking this earth stubbed his toe. I'm not exactly sure what he would have explained, but I'm sure it would have been perfect. But it would have hurt, and that would have been enough. Just dwell on that for a second. That would have been enough, and yet he still went to those lengths. Why? It's to show us the absolute depths of his love. This is why St. Paul said, I came to preach Christ and him crucified, and nothing else. That's the focal point. So when we look at the cross, we realize it's by the cross of Jesus Christ that we are redeemed. And we're called to share in the eternal exchange of love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Another way that I could sort of say what the Trinity is, I could say it's the self-offering of the Son to the Father in the Spirit. Everybody following on that? The self-offering of the Son to the Father in the Spirit. If we look to the cross, what do we see? We see the self-offering of the Son to the Father in the power of the Spirit. Incidentally, if I wanted to explain what the Mass was to us, I would say it's the self-offering of the Son to the Father and the Spirit. And if I wanted to say what's the whole life of the Church, I would say it's the you know, self-offering of the Son to the Father and the Spirit. It's everything is, in, is animated by the Holy Trinity, including our eternal destiny to live in that divine life. And that doesn't mean that we lose our individuality. I think sometimes we think about this on grand terms and we think, well, what does that even look like? I mean, what is heaven going to look like? Am I going to cease to be me? Am I going to lose all my individuality? But St. John of Damascus uses this analogy, and I think it's very helpful. He says it's like a... Have you ever put a red, uh, an, an iron fire poker in a fire for a long time? Anybody done that? What happens to it? It's red hot. It becomes red. Like it actually becomes so hot that it looks like it's on fire. Does it break down? No, it's, it's iron. Like it's not the, the uh, what do you call it? The melting point is way too high. Like it's not actually going to melt. But it looks like it's fire. It's actually become like fire. And so when we are in the love of God, it's like we take on that love and it becomes us. We become it. That's why St. Athanasius said that God became man so that man could become like God. So this call, this eternal exchange of love that we're called to is something that God desires for each of us. And not just those in the room or those over there, but everyone in the world. Even that person that cut you off on the way here. We all have equal dignity. We're made in God's image. We're fallen, yes, but God declares that we are loved. And God loves us because he is love. Therefore, it's him that declares our value. And so we're starting to get at, okay, if, what, am I worthy of love? Well, yes, because God says so. Right? And, and in some ways, it's not about you and me. We have worth and dignity because God says we do. He made it so. We say this in the Mass. We say, Lord, I am not 
worthy, that you should enter under my roof. And we're talking about our worthiness in relationship to God, right? not in relationship to others. We're not saying, well, I'm, I'm not worthy compared to that guy over there. He's got his life together. By the way, if you actually knew what was going on in that guy's house, he doesn't have his life together. Um, but God alone is worthy. So when we're talking about our worthiness, we're talking about our worthiness in relationship to God. Before God, we aren't worthy. But he says we are. He says we're worthy. Because what's the next thing we say? Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but... Only say the word and I shall be healed. There's a tremendous difference in worth between us and God. Father Mike Schmitz puts it this way. He says, if we claim that we are worthy of God, then it's like saying, God, you should have died for me. And we should bristle at that. We should be like, well, I, don't, I, I didn't say that. <laughs> God makes us able to be in his presence. Only say the word and my soul shall be healed. So we know that God is love and we know that we are worthy in some respect. But that sort of begs the question, what, what does worth even mean? Like, okay, I am, I'm worthy of love, great. What does worth mean, though? So there's a, a few things that Scripture says to us, and I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but I think it's worth looking at very briefly. So Scripture says that we are worthy of our calling. So that's, that's number one. In Ephesians 4.1, we hear this. Paul says, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So if we want to see, okay, what is that called to what? Well, Sparknotes version, go read the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, so that's your homework. Go read that. Uh, number two, worthy of the gospel. In Philippians 1.27, we see, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to you, come and see you, or am absent, I may hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So to have this manner of life is what St. Paul is saying. This worthiness of the gospel is to live as a citizen. Of where? A citizen of where? Heaven. heaven. Own it. You got it right. right. Good, yes. Our citizenship is heavenly. When we're baptized, we're marked for Christ for all of eternity. The next one, worthy of the Lord. Colossians 1.10. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. So there's a spiritual wisdom and a deep desire to grow in faith by being worthy of the Lord. We honor the Father with our lives, and we allow the Spirit to work unhindered in us. In 1 Thessalonians 2.12, we see worthy of God. Okay. So we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. The Ignatius New Testament Study Bible says this in the footnote for that passage. The Father summons his children to a royal inheritance kept in heaven. The saints will be given the fullness of this heavenly kingdom, but those unworthy of the calling will be denied it. So how do we live out that calling? How are we worthy? Again, reference the Sermon on the Mount. Okay. Does anybody know where to find the Sermon on the Mount? Matthew, Matthew 5. Okay. Matthew chapter 5. What's your homework? Matthew Read Matthew chapter 5. It's great. A lot of stuff. All right. Uh, worthy of the kingdom is the next one. This is 2 Thessalonians 1.5. There is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Hmm, not as rosy on that one, but fidelity through suffering is a means of sanctification. It helps make us worthy of the kingdom. So these are all different ways that we can be worthy, but how do we actually, how can we possibly share in this worth which God extends to us? Well, the Catechism says this in 850. The origin and purpose of mission. The Lord's missionary mandate is ultimately grounded in the eternal love of the Most Holy Trinity. The church on earth is by her nature missionary, since according to the plan of the Father, she has as her origin the mission of the Son and the Holy Spirit. The ultimate purpose of mission is none other 
than to make men share in the communion between the Father and the Son in their spirit of love. So how are we made worthy? Through the church. How do we enter into the church? Baptism. We enter into the church as, in, as through a doorway. And we come into the sacramental life. And so we are one in our, we're unified in our teaching, in our profession of faith. We're unified in our sacramental life. We're unified in the way that we live our lives as Christians. And we're unified in common prayer. One faith, one Lord, one baptism. And so if we have this faith in one God, and this is where I'm going to kind of wrap things up, the Catechism in sections 222 to 227 says this, Believing in God, the only one, and loving him with all our being has enormous consequences for our whole life. So if we truly want to live as if we are worthy of love, what does that require? God calls, and then we respond. God gives us the gift of faith, and then we respond in faith. But what are the consequences of that? Coming to know God's greatness and majesty. That's the first one. Living in thanksgiving. Right? And here, here's where we can jump around a lot. So, again, this comes from 224. Paragraph 224. But we can cross-reference and jump all the way to 2,637. And it says this, Thanksgiving characterizes the prayer of the church, which in celebrating the Eucharist reveals and becomes more fully what she is. Indeed, the work of salvation, Christ sets creation free from sin and death to consecrate it anew and make it return to the Father for his glory. The thanksgiving of the members of the body participates in that of their head. So here I'm just showing you that we can look at something from the profession of faith and see how it comes alive in the prayer of the church. Making good use of created things, trusting God in every circumstance, and then finally, knowing the unity and true dignity of all men. That's a big one. Right? If we want to know, am I worthy of love? We need to know what the heck we mean by dignity. I mean, how many of us, when we are talking about something in, in the secular culture, like um, pro-life arguments, for example, we say, well, every human being has dignity and worth. Well, what does that actually mean? Again, we already talked about what worth means a little bit, but what does dignity mean? Well, it's really kind of neat because that section in particular has four cross-references, and they cover a large section of the Catechism. So I'm just going to kind of go through these very briefly. So in the Profession of Faith, we hear in 356, um, this is from St. Catherine of Siena, by the way, so the saints are quoted a lot. What made you establish man in so great a dignity? Certainly the incalculable love by which you have looked on your creature and yourself. You were taken with love for her. For by love indeed you created her. By love you have given her a being capable of tasting your eternal good. God created us out of love to be like him. 360, uh, Catechism Paragraph 360 says, The human race forms a unity. Baptized or not, we are all one human family. I think sometimes we forget that that means that we need to be in solidarity with our brothers and sisters. But then we could jump to the sacramental life. So how does this actually, how does the dignity of man actually come alive in the sacramental life? Well, it says this, the sinner wounds God's honor and love, his own human dignity as a man called to be a son of God, and the spiritual well-being of the church, of which each Christian ought to be a living stone. So how does that affect the sacramental life? Well, when we sin, who do we hurt? Well, we wound our relationship with God. We, we hurt ourselves. But this is the beautiful thing. It's kind of like a... It, it is, I'm going to say, I'm going to stick to what I said. It is beautiful. When we sin, it hurts those around us. Now, why do I say that's beautiful? Because that, again, means that we need one another. We need to lift each other up. We need to hold each other accountable. We need to remember that we are not saved by ourselves and that we utterly rely on those around us. That's a, that's a position of humility. And it's something that we all need to work on across the board. 
every person. So then we can look at the life in Christ and we say, okay, well, how do we actually live that? Well, this is from uh, paragraph 1700, and it really sort of encapsulates a lot of things. The dignity of the human person is rooted in his creation and the image and likeness of God. It is fulfilled in his vocation to divine beatitude. So in other words, God wants us to be happy. Three, it is essential to a human being freely to direct himself to this fulfillment. So in other words, we have to cooperate with God's grace. Uh, Article 4 goes into by his deliberate actions. So human beings, we don't just sort of act unintentionally all the time. Sometimes we have to actually be intentional about what we do and realize that our actions have consequences. The human person does or does not conform to the good promised by God and attested by moral conscience. Human beings make their own contribution to their interior growth. They make their whole sentient and spiritual lives into means of this growth. With the help of grace, they grow in virtue, avoid sin, and if they sin, they entrust themselves, as did the prodigal son, to the mercy of our Father in heaven. In this way, they attain to the perfection of charity. So there's a lot there, but what is that paragraph saying? What it's actually doing is it's setting up the whole next section. So if you wanted to read more about any of that and say, okay, well, what does that actually mean? The catechism goes into it. So we're created in God's image. The equality of men rests essentially on the dignity of persons and flows from it, and that's regardless of social or cultural factors on the grounds of race, sex, color, social conditions, language, or religion. Right? We're all human, and as human beings we have dignity and worth. We don't get more dignity and worth because we chose correctly on this or this. And then finally, that fourth section, prayer. How does this come alive? And this is what I want to end with. This is from Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The Catechism continues. Prayer, formed by the liturgical life, draws everything into the love by which we are loved in Christ, and which enables us to respond to him by loving as he has loved us. Love is the source of prayer. I'm going to say that again because it's so important. Love is the source of prayer. Whoever draws from it reaches the summit of prayer. Here's the secret to prayer. It's about uniting our will with God's will. It's not more complicated than that. I think sometimes we think it has to be this way or it has to be this way. It doesn't. One of the best prayers that you can offer to God is your heart in humility. So here's a practical way to kind of enter into that. Look at something like the crucifix. Go to the church or go to the uh, Adoration Chapel and just look at Jesus, present in the Blessed Sacrament or on the cross, and just say, wow, thank you. Start from gratitude and just say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for for what you've done for me. Help me to to realize that, to understand it. And then just sort of silence yourself a bit. Allow that to wash over you, contemplate it, meditate on it. And what you'll find is that your heart, naturally, because of our disposition to God, will start saying things like, Jesus, I love you. That's the essence of prayer. That moment when your will is now turned to him, not yourself. Now you can start with all the things you need, right? Like I go to prayer and I'm like, all right, Lord, let's get this out of the way. I need this, 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 and this. Thank you. Okay, now, now that I got that out and I'm saying how I feel and I'm saying what like I'm bringing to the table here, Lord, quiet my heart and let me focus on you. And then I meditate and contemplate on something like the cross and then I say, Eventually, it just comes out of my heart. I, I can't even explain it. It's just, oh, Jesus, I love you. And I know you love me. Thank you. And that's prayer. I mean, that's that relationship. That's just being with him. One of the most beautiful prayers, people who pray, is uh, St. John Vianney, patron of priests, the cure de ours. And he, he, this is in paragraph 2658 of the Catechism. And I want to end with this. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
I love you, oh my God. And my only desire is to love you until the last breath of my life. I love you, oh my infinitely lovable God. And I would rather die loving you than live without loving you. I love you, Lord. And the only grace I ask is to love you eternally. My God, if my tongue cannot say in every moment that I love you, I want my heart to repeat it to you as often as I draw breath. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, are we worthy of love? Yeah. You bet your butt we are. <laughs> God is so good. So, we've got a little bit of time left, so uh, I told Andrew what I wanted to do for the last 15 minutes or so is just... Um, you know, do like a ask me any kind of thing kind of thing. I, uh, I worked at a parish for seven years and I was in catechesis, liturgy, music, annulment, ministry, marriage prep, OCIA, um, children, teens, adult catechesis, a lot, a lot of things and some other things besides. And now I teach religion and history at the high school. So. I don't know a lot of things. There's a lot of things I don't know, but there are quite a few things I do know. And I promise you that if I don't know, I won't make something up. So that's my promise to you. Um, and if I am gonna give you something that's not church teaching, that's just my opinion, I'll say that too. So with those sort of promises out of the way, what you got? Yeah. Um, I come from a Protestant background and I'm very new to the Catholic faith and um, so I was just, I'm, I'm still learning, I, I just started catechism, uh, so we haven't gone there, maybe we'll get there, um, but uh, what's the, the role of the Pope in the church and the meaning and significance and authority, just like a big picture for people that don't know much about the Pope? He's a sinner in need of God's grace. I don't mean Pope Francis, I mean all of them. Um, I think that's, we need to start there. One third of the popes in the history of the church are canonized saints. So they are people that the church has said, you know, their life is worth imitating. They were heroic men of virtue, really solid. <laughs> that means two thirds weren't. Now that doesn't mean they were all bad. But it does mean that they were human, right? So we need to keep in mind that the Pope isn't like, when we say the Pope is infallible, like that, that word's thrown around a lot, it's not understood very well. What that means is ultimately, and again, this is very, very high level, it's like, okay, we trust the Holy Spirit to guide and guard the church. We don't trust that guy or even all the bishops, but we trust that when all the bishops of the world and Pope speak together, that the Holy Spirit is working through that to protect the church from error on matters of faith and morals. So the things the church has always taught and the way that we ought to um, follow certain principles of morality. Now that doesn't mean that everything the Pope says is correct. It doesn't mean everything the Pope says is something that we should give total and complete adherence to as if our life depended on it. Right? They're, they're human beings like anyone else and they have opinions and sometimes their opinions are right Sometimes they're iffy, and, and in the history of the church, sometimes they're just plain wrong. But that doesn't affect the faith. The faith and moral teachings of the church are unchanging. They may develop, but they don't change. In other words, our understanding of them grows and broadens and deepens. Our appreciation for those teachings grows. So when we look at the Pope, what is he? He's the successor of Peter. He's the chief of the apostles, successors, so all of the bishops. He has a universal jurisdiction over the world, so in terms of governance, he's the head. Um, because hierarchically, that's how the church is set up. That's how Jesus founded it. And he gave that authority to Peter and the apostles. And he said to Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so we understand that the Pope is the visible head of the church. He's the visible symbol of unity in the church. And I think that's really the key, the visible symbol of unity. And so what does that unity look like? It's unity in, of governance, unity of teaching and preaching, unity of means of sanctification so through the sacraments, um, 
So in all of those ways, I think, I think that's the big thing, is this, this visible symbol of unity. Now, are all popes really good at living that out? No. <laughs> so, again, reference back to my first comment, there's sinners in need of God's grace. Um, does that kind of get at it? Any follow-up? Yeah, no, I think it's pretty straightforward. I think um, maybe Protestants some, sometimes have like a different view, like more like uh, the Pope's divine. Like they, mm. they hype it up more than it actually is for Catholics. Well, and there are and the there are some Catholics who fall into what the Church has called in the last 150 years ultramontanism. Ultra meaning over, and then montane meaning mountains. It's this idea that I'm a French person and I'm going to look over the mountains to the man in Italy for everything. Right, as like the supreme head of the church on earth that is in not just spiritual matters, but political matters, everything. And so that's an error leaning towards an excess. A deficiency would be like, I don't care what the Pope says. And so we got to find the, the middle, the middle position, um, where we say, okay, I'm going to listen charitably to everything that the Holy Father says, especially when he's teaching. Right, if he's teaching, then we should absolutely listen. Um, and, and really contemplate it and think about it and take it to prayer. If he's, I, I don't know, uh, on a plane giving an interview, we don't have to listen to him at all. <laughs> okay, I that maybe that's a little too far. This is being recorded. Um, <laughs> we, we should absolutely listen, take it seriously, be respectful, be charitable. But again, if the Pope says something on a matter that he's not an expert in, it's an opinion. And he just he just released a, a apostolic exhortation on climate change today, which I haven't read yet, so I'm not going to remark on it because I always read it first. Um, if anyone's interested in more on like Pope Francis in particular, on GoodDistinctions.com, I did go into. Uh, I asked the question: Is the Pope a socialist and globalist? And the answer might surprise you. I said no, but how I got there, that's the interesting part. So anyway, I highly recommend checking that out. But um. Very good. It's an interesting time we live in. Here's the thing. Remember what I said earlier? <laughs> Hundreds of years ago, people had to write to their friends in Rome to say who the heck is the Pope anyway, so that they can actually say the right name in the Eucharistic prayer. It's not important to us to know everything that the Pope says on a daily basis. In fact, it's very unhealthy. Because where should we be living out the faith? St. Thomas Aquinas Parish. <laughs> Here, and even more, more like if we want to get into subsidiarity a little bit further, your home. Right? That's where the faith comes alive, is your home. I am, I am completely convinced of this. The best way to define a parish in 2023 is a family of domestic churches. A family of domestic churches. So domestic church is your family where you live, at your home. Right? And the parish is a family of all of those domestic churches coming together. Well, if that's true, then we should care about what the Pope says, but maybe not every day. We should pray for him every day, but it's not really important that we hear absolutely all the commentary on everything. And so I think sometimes people can get into this rut of listening to, especially people on the internet, um, just talk nonstop about everything that's going on in the church as if they know a darn thing. They don't. The, most of them don't even get out of their houses. Like, I, I don't know that for sure, but like, it's just, how do you know that? Like, I, I just, I have to watch some of these people and I'm like, ah, I'm not sure. That's actually why I, I started my podcast with Good Distinctions is like, I was so tired of this extreme and that extreme. It's like, can we just talk about these things and find the middle ground, find the virtuous mean? So anyway, when it comes to the Pope, visible symbol of unity, shouldn't affect your daily life too much. If it does, probably some reprioritizing that needs to happen. You should care way more about what your family thinks, and then your parish, and then your local community, and then your broader community in your county maybe, and then your state, and then the region, and then the country. Which, by the way, this applies to politics too. Why do we care so much about the president? And we care, well, I do right now and every time I go to the gas pump, but, but we should care a little bit if it affects us. But if things are running well in terms of subsidiarity, the church is very clear on this in terms of Catholic social teaching. 
of uh, subsidiarity of the best decision is usually made at the local level, the, the lowest level possible and the highest level necessary. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. Um, I'm actually I'm teaching a class for the Institute of Catholic Theology on Catholic social teaching in the spring. So if anyone wants more on that, um, it's another thing. There's all kinds of cool stuff going on in this diocese. Um, anyway, any other questions? What time is it? Yeah, we got a few minutes. Yes. Where does the church stand on evolution in regards to evolution? I think we're running out of time, Andrew. <laughs> It's a good question. It's a very good question. Um, so this one is way out of my depth. I'm not very good at biology. Um, I will say this. We believe that we have a common, we have common ancestors as human beings, which actually science does back that up. You know, as we study the human genome, um, Everybody knows what mitochondria is, right? Oh, yes. the cell. Thank you, Gabe. I was really hoping you would say that. Uh, good. Yes, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. <laughs> I love those words. All right, so yes. How do you get mitochondrial DNA? Who is it from? The mother or the father? The mother, and only the mother. See, this is the interesting thing. When, as we study the human genome, every single human being on the face of the planet has trace amounts of the same mitochondrial DNA. Logically, biologically, do you know how that's possible? By having one common female ancestor. Interesting. The church is right, yet again. Okay. Um, We've also learned through, through other genetic testing that uh, it's very, very likely in terms of science that we have a common paternal ancestor as well. So that is not open really for debate. We have a common male ancestor, common female ancestor. How the bodies of those two were, were formed and fashioned and created is an open question in church teaching. So there are some who hold to a young earth creationist view that the world is 6,000 years old, that God created everything um, ex nihilo at one moment, that God, it was just like Genesis lays out in those six days. Um, St. Augustine believed that it was one 24-hour cycle. Other church fathers thought it was six actual 24-hour days. I wonder where the days came from when we didn't have the sun yet. You know, so it gets a little complicated, and that's where the Second Vatican Council says we need to take into consideration uh, genre when we're looking at something like Genesis, especially, um, and realize that it's not a science textbook. So while it is an open question, Pope St. John Paul II was actually very open to um, some sort of evolutionary biology things. Uh, Pope Benedict was as well. Now, are either of them scientists? No. So they're relying on scientists. And so that's where, I'll put it this way, faith and reason are never in competition. They are two wings of the same bird that rise us up to contemplate truth. If, our, if we believe that something in faith and reason is in opposition to one another, then our understanding of the faith or our understanding of reason is faulty, one or the other, because God, God's truth is God's truth, right? And so what's happening is there's actually two different questions that we're asking. The question of faith is not what exists, it's why does it exist at all? I mean, maybe that's philosophy, but like, why is there something rather than nothing? How did God create? Um, in terms of like, are we made in the image and likeness of God? That's a theological question. Whereas a science question is, how old is this rock? You know, that's not a theological question. Okay. So when we are asking these different questions, we need to take into account what kind of question we're asking. Why? Because we need to figure out the right tool to use to investigate that question. And so sometimes the scientific method might be the perfect tool. But if I'm asking, are we made in the image and likeness of God, I'm not going to apply the scientific method to that. I'm going to read sacred scripture. I'm going to see what the church has always taught about that. 
So it's, it's a, if you have a different question, you need a different tool to investigate it. Um, nobody's going to use a, hopefully you wouldn't use a tape measure to try to saw a piece of wood in half. But you got to have the right tool. That would be an odd project. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm sorry for the non-answer, but that's it's kind of where we're at, is the church doesn't have a definitive teaching. It's, uh, it's very much open to, it's open. It's an open question. Some things aren't. God created man in his image and likeness. Um, all human beings came from Adam and Eve. They did sin. Sin entered the world. Like, those things are true, and we hold to them. But all the specifics, that's, uh, yeah, that's okay. <coughs> Probably one more question. Yeah. There are some books in the Bible, Sirach, that are in some, not the other. And, and some are even you know, uh, talked about during the uh, why is that? Right. There are seven books in the Old Testament which are not contained in most Protestant Bibles. I say most because I actually knew a Methodist minister who accepted all seven deuterocanonical books. And so it's not a it's not a solid yes or no thing. Short answer is this. Uh, before the time of Jesus, there were 70 Greek scholars who gathered together to, to translate the Hebrew and Aramaic Old Testament into Greek. Okay? We call it the Septuagint because Septuagint means 70. Okay? So the Septuagint text was around in the time of Christ. It's the 43 books of the Old Testament. Very, very clear um, that it was before the time of Christ. Um, a little bit later, so after the time of Christ, there's a, a text called the Masoretic text that was written in Hebrew. And it's what a lot of the rabbinical traditions of Judaism after the destruction of the temple held to. And that one had 39 books. When Martin Luther came along, there was a few things in those seven books that he didn't really like. That talked about, like, I don't know, praying for the dead. Um, he said, eh, this is, I don't like that. So what he did is he reorganized his Bible and he put those seven sort of in the back. And his followers took them out. Sort of inexplicably. No real reason. They just said, well, he moved him. He probably didn't like him. Let's take him out. They're uh, kind of difficult with our theology anyway. Um, so that's where that kind of comes from. The Orthodox churches actually have more books than Catholics. Um, so the church has never said definitively, so I'm going to be very careful about this. The church has never said definitively which books aren't in sacred scripture. They've only said what is. Okay, so what does that mean? What's the implications of that? What it means is the Council of Trent said, these are the 73 books of the canon of Scripture. Definitively. Here they are. Are those other books that the Orthodox hold to Scripture? Well, as Catholics, we would say no. But the better answer might be not necessarily. See what I'm saying? Like, we're not saying what isn't in Scripture in terms of what Trent says in the 1500s. Now, there's certain texts that the church has said, no, that's not scripture. Uh, for example, there's a bunch of other gospels, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Thomas, the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of Peter. Those are all heretical. They're all very clearly not scripture. So when we're looking at the last 2,000 years, it's a little thorny. But what isn't is that the 73 books of the Bible that we have are scripture, which means that they are primarily written by God and secondarily by human authors. And therefore they're inerrant and we have to look at the whole canon. So um, really long way of saying Martin Luther went with the Masoretic text and we went with the Septuagint. There's a, it's, it's a long history. All right, it's a little bit after 720, so we should probably Wrap it up. But let's do a quick glory be. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Let's get everyone well. Um, and uh, that's the that's the like. That's what he teaches every day at JB2 to high school. So, yeah. Um, 
Good <laughs> JV too. Woo. Um, all right, so um, hopefully that was something that was like helpful for you. That I mean, I don't know, like just I, I, I love to know. Just by a show of hands, how many people here like got something new out of this? They just did not know before that there was just like that you learned something a little bit more about the faith. All right, fantastic. Good. I'm not going to call out the people back. Who thought that was dumb and they already knew all this stuff? <laughs> I, I, I learned something. I don't like that. So anyway, um, thank you guys so much for being here. It, it was great. Um, like I said, every month we're going to be having a sumo with a new speaker. A different person is going to be here to, to share on a different big question. Um, I, I, I should have the the next question for you guys so I can just give you the, the sneak peek. Um, I also want to tell you guys that... Um, uh, for all of you that are parents, and these are a part, part of what you can do for partnership hours is do this, so whether you even knew that or not, maybe you would just show it up anyway, um, just tell your catechist when you go pick up your kids and they'll like mark you down for being present to SUMA. And then um, the next one, November 1st, is Am I Free? And so we're going to be talking about grace and freedom. So if you ever thought, Am I free? We'll find out. So um, you guys have a wonderful rest of your night. Good luck if you're picking up your kids. We'll see you next month.